Okay, perfect. Now we can move on. So far, we were basing our decisions on a Q-learning strategy. So we were relying heavily on the Bellman equation to write down our loss function. And this is good because it's more data efficient. You can create a replay buffer, sample from the replay buffer, et cetera. But these types of methods are a little bit hard to get them to work. Why? Because there are a lot of parameters that you need to tweak, a lot of hyperparameters. So you have a lot of choices to make. Can we actually work in a direct way with the direct objective of reinforcement learning, which is maximizing your expected return? Can we work with that? And these types of algorithms that are going to rely on a policy, they are going to be called uh, policy optimization. And now we are going to cover a famous version of policy optimization, and that's called trust region. And it's TRPO algorithm, if you hear it that way. Let's introduce some notation. You have some infinite horizon discounted Markov decision process. S is your finite set of states. It doesn't have to be finite. So the algorithm is going to work for that. Your action doesn't have to be finite, but we are starting with finite set of actions and finite set of states because we are going to, as an intermediate step, write a theorem that is guaranteed to improve, to give you better and better expected return. So these assumptions are just for that theorem. But once you write down your algorithm, it could be continuous set of actions and continuous states. Then we have a transition probability which is gonna take you from state at time t, the action that you just took, to the next state, state as t plus one. And this is basically a probability distribution. So sometimes people approach reinforcement learning from different backgrounds. Some people had a controlled theory background and they're engineers and they could be from the mechanical engineering department or electrical engineering. They usually, they are more comfortable with writing a cost function rather than a reward. If you are coming from a background uh, in reinforcement learning, the modern way, you are gonna write a reward. If you are coming from economics, you are gonna write a utility function and maximize your utility. Okay, but uh, so these people are coming at it from a from the perspective of control theory. So they're gonna write a cost function. This is the negative of your reward the reward you want to maximize, the cost you want to minimize. Potato, potato, okay? You have an initial distribution. You have some discount factor. You have some stochastic policy, which is given the state. It's going to give you some action. We are going to have expected discounted cost. Previously, you had expected discounted return. This is now expected discounted cost. So you have a new notation, eta, and it's going to depend on your policy because your policy is gonna determine the next state. So you choose your actions based on your policy. You take that action, you condition on it, and then it's gonna give you the next state. Same as before, we are gonna define our state action value function. Each state and each action given the policy is gonna have a value. And its definition is very similar to what you have up there. Your value function is when you are getting rid of uh, AT. So you're doing an expectation over AT as well. That's going to give you your value function. So far, so good. This we knew about. So nothing new up until here. What's new is the definition of an advantage function. What is the advantage of taking this action compared to the average actions while you're doing an average over the actions? Why is this action advantageous? And how advantageous is this? So that's your advantage function. A new definition. This is one of those uh, unnormalized discounted visitation frequencies that we are never going to see in practice, but we need it for the sake of the mathematics. And this is just telling you if you start at initial state as zero, and then you take your actions based on your policy, what is the probability of visiting state S? And then you're discounting it. And it's unnormalized because this is not going to give you a probability distribution. So you have to divide it by something. So I'm not going to go into the details of the proof for this uh, approximation, this approximate policy iteration algorithm. We can read the paper, but uh, something nice. There is a message from this algorithm. And what's the message? What are we trying to do? The message from this algorithm, first of all, 
is that this algorithm is guaranteed to decrease your cost. So there is a proof that this algorithm is going to decrease your cost. Perfect. So there is mathematical reasons for this being rigorous. And you can see the proof. What else? What are we doing here? You are minimizing with respect to some policy of an objective function. This objective function is just a local approximation to the expected cost, basically this guy, the expected cost of policy pi when you are writing it in terms of pi prime. So when you write it in terms of pi prime, you're gonna have the cost of pi prime plus some additional terms, some adjustments. And this is where the advantage function is gonna come in. So this is the advantage of taking policy pi over pi prime. So this is the advantage of taking policy pi over pi prime. So it's very close to the expected uh, discounted cost of policy pi prime plus some adjustments. So this objective up until here makes sense, but there is something nice happening in the theorem. And that is the fact that uh, the KL divergence between pi i and pi is showing up. So I want you to take this into account that there is a KL divergence popping out of this algorithm, popping out of this theorem. But this algorithm is not practical. It's not practical because if you use this coefficient here, and you do the maximization, which is impossible for you if your state is not finite. So this is, this is impossible to compute that. This is impractical for two reasons. One, computing this guy is not easy. The other one is choosing C according to the theorem is gonna give you a step size that is very small. It's tiny. So your algorithm is gonna take forever to converge. This is an impractical algorithm with rigorous mathematical justification behind it. But what I want you to take home is the, is the fact that the KL divergence is showing up. And then we are gonna make that uh, algorithm practical uh, next session. So we are gonna introduce neural networks. We are gonna change this maximization to an expectation. And that's gonna give us a practical algorithm. It's not gonna be as rigorous as mathematically rigorous as this algorithm, but it's going to be useful in practice. And that's going to give us the trust region policy optimization algorithm. Okay, I think it's a good time to stop and then cover the next, the rest of it next session. For those of you who have questions, I'll be around. I have a question. Sure. Um, so within this algorithm one, I understand that pi i, pi sub i is like our current policy that we're iterating on. Mm -hmm. But what is pi? So pi is the new algorithm that you want to come up with. So far, you arrived at a policy pi i. That's your base policy. And now you want to improve upon that. To do that, you need to solve a minimization problem to give you pi from the, for the next step. Oh, OK. I see. Yes. OK. So we're minimizing over all possible policies. Exactly. So okay. this is going to be all possible policies. And, and that's, that's going to give you the next hard. one. Because that can grow, that's huge as your state space grows and your like action space grows. Yes, but uh, solving that shouldn't be a problem. The, uh, the problem is this maximization here and the fact that C needs to be very small. Actually, C is not small. C is that coefficient here, but then your steps are going to be very small. Hmm. So it won't be a, like, even if we have like, I mean, if we have the number of states on an order n and the number of actions on order n. Mm -hmm. Then we have n squared. Well, I guess maybe that doesn't make sense. So there is a, this, this is going to be belonging to reinforcement learning. So it's not going to, this algorithm is not deep reinforcement learning because there is no deep learning going on here. So you are not approximating your functions by any neural network yet. Mm -hmm. And that's why we needed to start with the assumption of finite state and finite action so mm -hmm. that you can put your policy on a grid. You can put uh, exactly your policies on a grid and then keep maximizing. Mm -hmm. Same thing here. You are, you are going to put your advantage function on a grid. So it's going to be a tabular uh, Excel spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. okay? So these are matrices. Mm -hmm. And then yes, you can apply that algorithm to that type of a that type of an environment. 
But uh, going beyond that, when you have your state being continuous, your actions being continuous, this algorithm is not going to work. Yeah. Because maximization here is not easy. And here you need to parameterize your pi by a neural network. Otherwise, it, there, guess... there's no way for you to put a grid on your state space, which is high dimensional. Mm -hmm. I, I guess it seems to me that it would also be infeasible, even if you had a finite number of states and actions, but if those were very big. Yes. So that's the computational cost. And some people might say, maybe you can parallelize it. Maybe you can scale it. But as your action and state becomes continuous, then forget about it. You cannot mm -hmm. use a table or a matrix to do your work. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the reason for it is very simple. In 1D, if you put a grid on your space, let's say your interval is from zero to one. If you put a grid, you can put 10 points. In 2D, you need to put 10 squared. Mm -hmm. In 3D, you need to put uh, 10 cubed. And then that's the curse of dimensionality. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's why neural net you need to work with neural networks because their degrees of freedom is not tied to any grids in your space. The degrees of freedom on your, are your weights and biases. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yep. they are good for high dimensional stuff. Okay. I have, um, a question just about the, these mappings, like um, pi, pi is a probability of taking a certain action given a certain state. Yes. Okay. So the, I was thinking like a, a policy should map from state to action, but in this case, it's saying like any, Actually, it's any the same thing. Yeah. As soon as you choose an AS, pi of s is going to give you a probability distribution over your a's. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay. It's the same thing. And then if you're more, if you're more certain on a certain action being the good one, then it'll be um, closer to one. And if it's not really, um, if there's no good option, then it'll just be kind of uniform or, or random. Exactly. Yes. And then same thing with the capital P. That's, that's the same idea. Like given a current state and a, current action, there's some probability of it putting us in a new state. Yes. So in the previous paper, you saw this. It was taking you from S and A to the space of probability distributions over S. Yeah. Okay. And over there, you also had pi that was giving you from S, taking you from S to the space of probabilities over the action space. But then you can reformulate that this way. Now your output is just R. And your output here is just an interval. Mm -hmm. But then it's just the same concept. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah.